This is a note about the content of this video. In this case, this book contains a scene which may be potentially triggering or otherwise difficult for some people, so please use your discretion. In this case, the book contains a scene which I will discuss as I do, uh, relating to an overdose of sleeping pills and an attempted suicide attempt. This is not a major component of the book, but something worth knowing before going in. Thank you. I am very famously really, really, really into angels. I love angels so much, they are my special interest. They're great, I love angels. Fun fact, I also really like demons. Um, I like angels, I like demons. Fallen angels rank third for whatever reason, I guess if I had to pick. But angels are my, I love those guys. And how it actually legitimately, I think, happened when I was very young is that <laughs> I was very much in a place where everybody was really into demons. I don't know, it was... 2000s. People were really into demons, and I wanted to be a cool, unique child. So I was like, um, everyone thinks angels are lame, so I'll think angels are cool. And um, that became my core personality. That just sort of hardwired, just that got saved into my bones, and I've been stuck with that ever since. But no, I, I love a demon. I think they're great. And um, the only credit that the book I'm going to talk about today can get is that it is a demon book, and that's actually really rare in the kind of YA period that I talk about. So the 2010s paranormal YA genre had tons of angels in it, tons of fallen angels, I'm sort of overlapping those in one category, very few literal demons in there. Like literal, just straight out of hell demon boys. Not very common, not even like half demon boys, which this book unfortunately is a half demon boy. I kind of wonder why we never saw that that much, and I sort of landed on, again, controversy. I, I don't really think that that's, I think that's kind of ridiculous, but like, a demon is a wholly evil entity, and fallen angels have some sort of dose of good in them, there's some drama there, and maybe that's why we don't have demon, like, as a love interest that often, just because it seems more sacrilegious than having angels and fallen angel romance. I mean, look, they're all kind of the same sacrilegious, but I think that maybe more moms would protest the demon romanticization than they would the angel or fallen angel romanticism. That's my theory, at least. That's my game theory, at least. But I, I, I really don't know. I'm sort of wondering if anyone has insights in this or if there's been a huge amount of demon romances that have just totally missed out on. Like, I know they're out there, but I consider myself a bit of an expert in this very small subgenre. Not very common. So that was one of the reasons I decided to pick up a very generic paranormal romance title called Falling Under by Gwen Hayes. I so rarely say the author. I don't think anyone's ever heard of this book. I don't know. It's not one I'd ever heard of until I stumbled upon it. And it's a demon book. That's the only thing it has going for it. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of potentials for demons, and I was really kind of excited in that way. Sickly excited, because I knew that this was going to be a really bad book. But, you know, sickly excited. But, yeah, the execution is that instead of some fun demon stuff, we just have this weird, silly hellscape with a succubus called Mare and her really sucky half-human son, Hayden Black. Because, you know, Jake Thorne was a bit too ridiculous. Let's just walk into this and let's just have a little bit of fun together. And to really kind of keep you, keep you listening in here, I am going to read the, um, the quote so horrible, I'm thinking I'll put it in the thumbnail and I'm not sure if YouTube will then, like, get me for use putting this in the thumbnail, okay? This is a quote from the love interest of this book, Hayden Black. I have to admit, the trollop dress was becoming, but I find your virginal nightgown pushes the blood through my veins with greater force. Hayden Black. Oh no. <laughs> The plot of Fallen Under is basically everything, like, everything you already know. Regular, average, not like other girls, typical girl, Thea, is a rich violin virtuoso with an overprotective dad. <laughs> One day, she's in bed, and she sees a guy fall from the sky and burn to shreds. 
She assumes that this is just like a dream, but then she starts having these reoccurring, very realistic dreams about a boy named Hayden and a rose garden full of just ghouls and skeletons. The next day, he appears in her school. However, Dream Hayden and Life Hayden have very different attitudes. Dream Hayden, who wears like coattails and a cravat, is polite and charming, where real Hayden is entirely ambivalent. Thea then starts to get some vague psychic warnings from a cross-dressing su surfer dude who reads her tarot card, and he pulls death three times, like that Father Ted bit, but he, he doesn't offer any advice. He just like pulls death three times, somehow. And then pretty quickly, Life Hayden starts acting more familiar with Thea, seemingly making her jealous on purpose. Like there's some really weirdly horny things because we're in the 2010s paranormal romance thing. Like legitimately there's a scene where he grinds on a girl in a teen nightclub. YA books always have teen nightclubs. I've never seen one. And he then is making direct eye contact with Thea as he grinds on this other girl and Thea can then physically feel like she's doing it. I, I don't know. That's just like, we're just out the gates. That's what's going on. And he also takes her stumping. And stumping is something I assumed was a real term, but I can't find much evidence for it being a term, which adds another layer of bizarreness to this whole book, like stumping. If you've heard of it, it probably is real. I just, I can't find it. So this is the only like memorable formula breaking bit of this weird little book is Hayden, the bad boy slash nighttime charming boy, takes Thea out stumping. He drives past her in a truck and he's just like, hey, wanna go stumping? And stumping is driving down muddy, bumping roads at full speed and holding on to dear life as the truck just like bounces and hits the air. And it sounds extremely deadly. I very much believe this is a thing people are doing in the countrysides, but I, the author seemingly has made up a term for this. So Hayden, you know, breaking everything you'd expect from this bad boy, demon, you know, sexy, charming guy, everything you'd expect from him, he's a truck boy. <laughs> he's just, he's a truck boy, he's a country boy, you know? And that actually is a little bit delightful. I kind of want to see more demons that are just like country boys that just like, I went to high school with this demon, basically. I'd like to see that. So Hayden continues to be a bit of a prick despite his country boy side, including calling Thea a trollop, which becomes a reoccurring kind of romantic term. Like the scene that she decides she's in love with Hayden after their various escapade, is the scene where he goes, the trollop dress was becoming. That's when she decides she's in love with him. That works on her. Hayden then reveals he's half-demon, and he's only on Earth to find a human bride to bring to the underworld. He's been watching Thea from a looking glass in the underworld and picked her, but found she was too beautiful when he met her to, like, ever harm. Like, he just instantly was so struck when they actually met. And also, Thea is special, of course. She resists his demon pheromones, unlike other girls. He's decided he could never hurt her by bringing her to hell and is going to go back to his evil mother empty-handed and just accept punishment for his failure. They kiss and Thea is, again, just totally in love with him and this lovely sacrifice. Thea then stops dreaming about Hayden as he goes back to hell and he stops going to the school. To see Hayden again, because she misses him so much, she steals sleeping pills and takes a bunch so she can enter a deeper sleep. This would kill you. <laughs> she finds Hayden again, but is eventually woken up by her father, who rightfully assumed that she tried to kill herself. The whole incident isn't really given that much weight for how deeply serious it is. Like, Thea is so quickly persuaded or decides to overdose on medication for the chance to see her not boyfriend. There's no moment of reflection from her at all, like, before or after, and if anything, she's a bit annoyed that everyone is worried about her doing this. Thea then becomes very depressed because Hayden isn't around, including moodiness, failing school, not enjoying the violin. Luckily, I guess, a portal to hell suddenly opens in her room and she's abducted by some skeletons. After burning alive to pieces and then starving in a dungeon for a while, and afterwards she decides she'd gladly do it again for Hayden, Thea finds Hayden's mother, Mare, has brought her here to marry Hayden. Neither of us really want this to happen because Mar Mare is evil. Even though they're deeply in love, they just, 
if the fact that the mom is kind of pushing it makes it, you know, it really loses a bit of appeal. Mara then puts Hayden and Thea in a room together and drop some just like sex pheromones from the ceiling. So they're just super, super horned up. They are extremely just so horned up, but Thea is suddenly whisked back to the living world by her friends who have done an arcane ritual. <laughs> Lamenting Hayden is still in the underworld, they then summon Hayden out of hell and hey, he's out too, but he's acting suddenly like a huge prick. And after Hayden is just like a jerk for a couple pages, Thea is re-abducted to the underworld. Which, I mean, if it's so easy to do this, why did Hayden ever come up to the surface in the first place? It seems so easy to send these skeletons and opening portals everywhere. They're just doing all the time at this point. So, Thea, back in the underworld, realizes Hayden was acting like such a jerk because the demon invoking spell only invoked his demon half to Earth. His human half is stuck in the underworld, incorporeal. Thea makes a deal with Mar, Mare, it's Mare, that she'll happily marry Hayden and live in the underworld forever, as long as Mare doesn't destroy Hayden's human half. Then we enter the Weird Zone. The book changes perspective entirely quite near the end. Like, before it was first-person Thea with this random rare third-person Hayden, but now it becomes first-person Hayden. I don't really like it when books do this usually, especially a book like this where it's not some sort of ambitious literary device. It's just like, I don't know why they did it. He's the main character now, main character is in first person. I think that's probably as deep as it went. So through methods entirely unclear, Hayden is now entirely human and lives on Earth, and it's been a few weeks since Thea made her deal and just disappeared. Thea's friends know about the whole demon thing and like what went down, but Hayden has lost all memory of Thea for unclear reasons. He starts having dreams then where he meets Thea. Role reversal! Thea tells him that because she made a deal with Mare, or maybe it's Mara because I seem to have spelled it both ways in this whole thing, their blood intermingled and now Thea is half demon as well. If you look too carefully at this, you'll realize that by that logic, Thea is now Hayden's blood half-sister? But let's just, like, not ponder that too long, okay? So Hayden realizes that for some reason, and I, I can't state this enough, I have no idea why and the book doesn't either, his demon half is stuck in a necklace that Thea had. So he releases his demon half from this necklace and regains his memory, and then pops down into the underworld to go abduct Thea to Earth, since her deal was like she couldn't leave the underworld, not be kidnapped. And that's just how the book ends. So yeah, kind of a generic paranormal romance of the era, mixed with a couple really strange decisions, and I'm gonna kind of go a little bit more into um, some details of it. <laughs> The main thing here is Mary Sue's. Thea, oh my gosh, Thea. Let me read a quote that Hayden says, like legitimately. The other girls, they try very hard to sparkle. You, you just glow without any effort at all. Hayden to Thea. I, like, oh gosh, there's so much not like other girls energy in this book, specifically with Thea. and. So I used to be bona fide obsessed with Mary Sue's. Mary Sue's were kind of a special interest when I was like 11. And you might be like, like that makes no sense. You might think that I'm exaggerating how that's even possible. And I'm not, I just, I read articles on the concept of Mary Sue's as a child. And I just read and reread some like wikis on just Mary Sue's. I was reading parody comics all the time. I was rereading parody comics all the time. I was just Mary Sue obsessed. And I don't really know why it's just, you know, the autism, I guess. Like, by all accounts, too, the fact that I was really into reading about Mary Sue's and making fun of them as a concept, pretty crazy, because at the time, and before, <laughs> I had a Mary Sue of my own. Uh, her name was legitimately Asterix. Um, <laughs> didn't know about the Viking guys. She had naturally red hair that was blue at the tips. It was naturally blue at the tips. You know, she was like the daughter of Team Magma's Archie and a Team Aqua admin, and she got picked by Ho-Ho, who was like a god in this universe, to become a god. And she loved human experimentation, and she had a giant spaceship that like picked up space refugees as she went from planet to planet. And anyways, I know like a lot about Mary Sue Meta. And it is kind of surprising that in all of my YA reading from this era, 
This is the book I found with the most not like other girls, Mary Sue. Like, there's a lot of Mary Sues when it comes to this sort of thing, which as a critique term sometimes I think can reduce character critique down to just like, Mary Sue, end of discussion. So sometimes it's not really a helpful term, and it's not like I'm, you know, crazy about it myself now, but there's pretty much no other way to describe, like, Thea. <laughs> because, oh my gosh. Thea. She describes herself as not like other girls. She's so strange and weird. She's from England and she has an English accent. So she has so much social stigma at her high school. She wears pretty dresses and she has lots of curls in her hair. She is an amazing violin player and she hasn't kissed a boy, unlike all those other popular girls. This book is very rife with popular kid hate for a friend group and protagonists who mostly seem like the most normal kids ever. Thea and her two friends call the popular kids snitches, like Dr. Swayze, and much of it is made about like the cheerleaders and their exposed dress compared to Thea, who would never show so much skin. Look at this legitimate conversation that happens, okay? This is Hayden again. Why haven't you been kissed? I rolled my eyes at his innocence. You obviously know I'm not like other girls. I'm shy and I don't spend time with boys. My father is strict and... That's not why. You were waiting. All YA protagonists from this era, etc., other caveats, you know, they're all beautiful. <laughs> they need their love interests to moon over their unique beauty and feature, though they never seem to think they're at all attractive. Every description of them sure sounds like a conventionally attractive, skinny white girl with long hair. But, you know, it's just... <sighs> Here again. I was dressed no differently than any other girl in that club. I argued. But you are different from those other girls. His pupils enlarged, darkening his eyes eerily. That's some good writing. It's always been odd to me how the whole not like other girls narrative existed in YA like this. Beyond the fact that the idea of a popular crowd that you see in media is just like a total myth, surely. I've definitely, it's pretty much just a myth. I've never seen someone who talks about how strange they actually are be that strange. I mean, one of Thea's friends, I think, could claim that title because there is her friend, a pastel goth Korean psychic who no one takes seriously. But even then, like, the idea that there are other girls has always been such an odd one to me. Like, even when I was busy being bullied and suffering as a teen, I really grasped the concept. I think a lot of kids grasp the concept of it. Which kind of leads this mystery of why YA at the time is so obsessed with writing the popular girls and the beat down girls and these super exaggerated stereotypes that just don't match. They can't match anyone's high school experience, right? Like, was it like that for all of these authors back in the day? Or are, are they just like one after another taking the easy idea of mean girls and average girls and just, they're just one after the other copying each other's tropes? I'm not really sure, but it is quite weird because I remember it so much, it's in all of the books of this time, and not like other girls doesn't make any sense. Anyways, a little bit rambly here. When I first read this book, I was recovering from a spinal tap, so um, a lot of my notes on the book and my initial review of the book may be influenced a bit by that. <laughs> Let me talk a bit more about Hayden and demons. So, this is Hayden describing some- okay. You're so beautiful, he whispered. Sometimes I dream about your heart-shaped mouth for hours. <laughs> okay, so, um, for a book about demon romance, they took a really annoying route here. Like, Hayden is only half-demon, and even then it seems easy to just separate him into, like, a law and chaos half. It's kind of like the author doesn't understand the inherent appeal of monsters and why people are into them. Like, I don't want Hayden. I mean, we can stop there. But like, I don't want Hayden the human. Who wants Hayden the human? What sort of girl is reading this like, wow, I'm so into Hayden as a human guy. Like, you know, if I'm wanting this guy, I want Hayden the monster who can still respect boundaries and wants and must work through his own problems to be with me. Like, there's a whole thing on it. Also, he should still have horns and wings and stuff. And he doesn't in this book, and that's extremely lame. If you're gonna be writing a demon romance, why would you just make a guy who's a bit edgy? You know, like, aim higher. 
Hayden is one of the lesser bad boy boyfriends of the 2010s paranormal romance scene. The book can be pretty boring. There's not much action or even that many funny things of no. I am skimming so much of these things to bring you this, you know, news feed about it. Hayden to match this is almost lethargic in his personality. He ought to be hot and cold, one thing in the day and another in the dreams, but his real life self is remarkably normal. He tries to set some stakes in saying Thea and him should never touch, but they do and he says it's fine, nothing will actually happen, it's just forgotten about. He then tells Thea off for wearing provocative clothing, but he's really into it so like it's fine. He slightly stalks her with his magic mirror, but not to an absurd degree, he just kind of like looked at her a couple times. Like, am I asking that he was more of an abusive creep? I guess? It's not great for Thea, it's not great for literature, it just would make this a little bit easier to discuss this absolute waste of a person here. This is a quote. Hayden stared at the bathroom mirror instead of going to class. And I think that Hayden staring at a mirror for 45 to 90 minutes sums him up pretty well as a character. The only thing that Hayden does, which is objectively anything, is, um, well, we just call it... It's a normal school day. Thea stops a boy, Gabe, and asks him to come study after school. Gabe is the boy her friend has a crush on, and Thea is feeling a bit bold today. Normally she'd never dare talk to a popular kid. Across the hall, Hayden. He sees this. He stares daggers. The lockers begin to violently swing about, doors slamming open and shut, smashing against confused students. A teacher blames the wind for unclear reasons. The period bell rings, and it keeps ringing. The bell rings louder and louder, a shrill force described as an electric screwdriver boring holes into the bone of the jaw. Students panic and begin to flee the building, pushing each other aside in a frantic bottleneck. Vertigo grips students, the noise so penetrating it causes people to stumble and trip, unable to focus on anything but the horrible din. People throw chairs out of windows and jump out. Students, children, really, are battered and bruised as they limp across the lot next to the school. Their hearing is gone. People scream into phones, crying out, trying to contact parents and help but unable to hear. It is difficult to remain conscious as pain and nausea remain. The bells continue. The building, evacuated, is abandoned in favor of the hospital. There is bleeding, even broken bones resulting from the rush. Hearing slowly returns, a persistent ring still lingering in the skull. All students are equal. Children hear in the face of the bell ringing. Devastated. Days later, the school reopens. The only mark of the incident is a brown paper bag affixed to each bell. Why? To hide the bullet holes. The only way to take out these bells was a high-caliber rifle. Some bells took two, even three, to down them. It was the only way to kill them. The only way to restore peace. Anyways, Hayden does that. I know I wrote it, like, really dramatically, and I said it so greatly, but, uh, no, that's pulled from exact quotes. That is very much, like, all real quotes. And, yeah, Hayden makes the bells go so loud, a bunch of people are hospitalized because he doesn't like Thea talking to another boy. Also, the town decided to deal with the bells by shooting them, which is really, really funny the longer you think about it, so please just keep thinking about it, because... They It took multiple bullets to take out the- they couldn't take the bells off the wall. They couldn't unplug the bell power source. They had to assassinate the bells with high caliber rifles in a small town of like 3,000 people. Who knows how much of the town's budget was spent on just like military grade rifles and finally they got to break them out to deal with the bells. It's kind of an incredible moment. <laughs> It's also maybe the highlight and maybe why I want to even talk about this book at all, because ultimately Falling Under, it's an odd little book. It doesn't do very much of the demon stuff at all. It ends in this confusing way that establishes a direct blood relation between the main characters somehow. And there is a Navy SEAL team that had to take out some bells. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of just all you can ask for and all you can want. 
there you go. It's just sort of a short little review, but I have a couple of these books like this where I just sort of want to talk for them for a little bit. It's not the same as my really deep, huge, long videos, but those take a lot of time to work on. So doing a couple of these older backlog reviews, which are just sort of one-off odd little books. I hope that people still like them and have fun with them. Like, I know that they're never going to be as popular, but, you know, I still hope people like them and have fun, <laughs> as I already said. Anyways, cheers, you know? Have a great day. <laughs>